Hey everyone, today we're spotlighting one of the greatest to ever appear on American Horror Story, the one and only Sarah Paulson. That's right, along with Lily Rabe and Evan Peters, Paulson is one of three cast members to be on eight seasons of American Horror Story. So let's start back at the very beginning. Paulson's first AHS performance starts with everyone's favorite Craigslist medium, Billy Dean Howard. Medium to the stars? So you're like a shitty Miss Cleo. Excuse me? For her performance, Paulson earned a Primetime Emmy nomination for Outstanding Supporting Actress. Billy Dean made her first appearance in Season 1's Murder House when her longtime friend Constance Langdon invited her over to the Haunted House in an attempt to get her son Tate to move on to the next world. While working with Constance, Billy Dean is able to hear the other spirits living in the Murder House. Now, Billy Dean describes herself as a medium and she does not like to be called a psychic, as she would tell Violet that she cannot see into the future. She claims her powers first emerged when she was 25 years old. She has the ability to communicate with spirits via telepathy. Telepathy. She's this show's very own Deanna Troy as she can read their thoughts such as guilt, regret, or sadness. On one occasion, Howard would tell Constance the story of the Antichrist and the end of times. A child born of human and spirit will usher in the end of times. Next, she would go over the history of the Roanoke Colony, which we would learn more about a handful of seasons later. While helping Violet and Constance, Billy Dean mentioned that she was working on a reality show for Lifetime, in which she would communicate with the dead. I've just come from a meeting at Lifetime. They're interested in making a pilot with me. A Craigslist psychic with a Hollywood agent. And fast forward to Hotel years later, Billy Dean wasn't kidding. She became a famous medium for the stars. Mr. Wu doesn't pay for what? Winters was invited to the Hotel Cortez by Iris in order to communicate with the spirit of Liz Taylor's boyfriend. In the year 2022, while trying to communicate with John Lowe's ghost on Devil's Night for her Lifetime TV show, the ghost of the hotel, including Ramona Royale, threatened to kill her if she ever talked about any of the hotel spirits again. I think she got the message loud and clear. <laughs> The very next season, Paulson would play journalist Lana Winters. Her story begins at Briarcliff Manor after the asylum makes headlines because of the Bloody Face murders. Everyone assumes that Kit Walker is responsible for the murders when his wife goes missing, when in fact, they were abducted by aliens. The story attracts the up-and-coming journalist to the asylum, who says she's there to do a story on the Briarcliff Bakery. Eventually, Sister Jude finds out about Lana's secret plan after she sneaks into the asylum after hours. Jude would commit Lana herself into the asylum against her will and blackmails Lana's partner, Wendy, into complying. Sister Jude's disturbing plan is to treat Lana with electric shock therapy. In Season 2 episode I Am Anne Frank Part 2, Dr. Threadson helps winners break out of Briarcliff only to immediately follow this special moment by revealing himself to be Bloody Face. What kind of material do you use? Skin. <laughs> Threadson intended to keep Lana alive to be the mother he never had as a child, and he later rapes her while Skaha looks on. Soon after, the Angel of Death would return to offer to end Lana's suffering. She almost gives in to the kiss of death but changes her mind. Not long after, Lana escapes Threadson's lair only to end up right back at Briarcliff after a car accident. But you're safe now. Back to Briarcliff. Where you belong. With Lana's knowledge of the true bloody face killer, Threadson attempts to kill her at the asylum, but Kit steps in and saves the day and knocks him out. Soon after, Lana finds out she's pregnant from the rape and uses this to get Threadson to confess while Kit secretly records him. And with the help of Mother Superior, Winters is able to take the tape and escape the asylum in epic fashion. <laughs> Afterwards, Lana waits with a gun at Threadson's house, telling him that she's already turned the evidence over to the police before personally killing him. Winters would later give birth to the baby and puts the child up for adoption. As the years went on, Lana published a book about Threadson and managed to get the asylum shut down in 1971 with a documentary called Briarcliff Exposed. And in 2013, Lana was confronted by her crazed son Johnny Morgan at gunpoint in revenge for attempting to abort him. Johnny became a modern day bloody face after he grew to idolize his late father. Lana tried to de-escalate the situation and assured Johnny that he was nothing like his horrible father, and then uses his own gun to kill him, blaming herself for her son's murders. Just like Billy Dean Howard, Lana Winters would pop up in future seasons, including the sixth season Roanoke, coming out of retirement in 2016 to interview Lee Harris in her show, The Lana Winters Special. Winters is also name-dropped in cult as she requests an interview with Allie for her show, but is turned down. Paulson's next and possibly most iconic performance has to be Coven's Cordelia Good. We first met Cordelia back in episode one of Coven when Zoe Benson was sent to her new home in New Orleans. Coincidentally, Fiona also returned to the school at this time because she heard that a witch was recently murdered. Misty Day had been living in the nearby swamps and was burned alive. 
We're also introduced to Cordelia's husband, Hank Fox. The two have unsuccessfully been trying to conceive a child. After their latest doctor visit, they decide to try some dark magic, which includes some large eggs, black salt, blood, snakes, and fire on the floor sex. That still doesn't work, and as a last ditch effort, Cordelia visits Marie Laveau, begging for her voodoo help. But Marie declines Cordelia's plea for help. You were born into the wrong tribe. You were the daughter of my sworn enemy. <laughs> To make matters worse for Cordelia, we soon find out that her husband is a horrible human being. He's been having an affair behind her back, and as we later find out, he's actually part of a secret witch-hunting organization. This same organization, the Delphi Institute, orchestrates an acid attack on Cordelia. Sure, Cordelia was horrifically scarred and blinded from the acid attack, but she gained the power of the sight, and she was able to have visions of the truth. This is ultimately how she found out about her husband's infidelities. So long, Cordelia Fox, and hello, Cordelia Good. Now get out of here. Get out! Baby. Oh, you're, my, you're my heart. I'd get out while you still can, Jughead. This is also how she finds out that Fiona had murdered Madison and framed Myrtle for the murder. Thanks to Misty Day, Myrtle is resurrected, and she helps Cordelia get a new pair of eyes. All it took was a melon baller. Following all these events, Cordelia vows to stop her mother once and for all. She orchestrates a plan to try to get Fiona to take her own life. This plan ultimately falls through, and Cordelia needs her mother's help in order to take on the witch hunters. Now, Cordelia wasn't a big fan of her new eyes because she lost the power of the sight. Adding to more eyeball violence, Cordelia uses her gardening shears to blind herself again. Her powers were restored, and she has a vision of Fiona killing all of the potential Supremes as well as herself. Now, all of the Witches of the Coven must attempt the Seven Wonders to determine who's the next Supreme. The test takes the lives of Misty and Zoe. An angry Kyle kills Madison for refusing to bring Zoe back to life. But then Cordelia resurrects Zoe, proving once and for all that she is the Rising Supreme. <laughs> The one true supreme. Cordelia decides to run the coven with openness and reaches out to any and all young witches around the world who need her help. She even provides her email address. Now Myrtle demands that she pay for her own sins, so she's subsequently burned at the stake again. This is obviously very difficult for Cordelia because Myrtle was more of a maternal figure than Fiona ever was. Fiona returns one last time to the academy to confront her daughter. Nearing the end of her life, Fiona begs Cordelia to help her, but she refuses. Fittingly, Fiona dies in her daughter's arms, and finally, with Fiona's passing, Cordelia officially becomes the Coven's Supreme. Season 3 ended with Cordelia addressing a full room of young witches in their new home and family. What's a Supreme? You're looking at her. Cordelia's name would pop up yet again in 2015's Hotel. Queenie had won a ticket to visit The Price is Right, great show, and it turns out that Cordelia is the one who enchanted that very ticket. Well, I hope you get called to come on down. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually guaranteed between you and me. My Supreme did a little something something to my ticket, so it's enchanted. Now, unbeknownst to Cordelia, Queenie's trip to LA would ultimately end with her quickly dying at Hotel Cortez. But don't worry, that wasn't the last we saw of Cordelia. She returned for Season 8's Apocalypse crossover as the Coven Witches battled against the Antichrist Michael Langdon. Fast forward to 2016, when Cordelia attempted to track down Queenie after she went missing on her trip out west. Cordelia ran into Queenie and James March playing cards at Hotel Cortez. And despite multiple attempts, Cordelia was unable to escape with Queenie. Turns out the hotel is some sort of demonic hell spot, and even her powers aren't strong enough to free Queenie. Cordelia leaves the hotel empty-handed and calls this her greatest failure. Against Myrtle's wishes, Cordelia resurrects her mentor to help in the fight. Soon enough, the Coven Witches are invited to the Hawthorne School for Exceptional Young Men, aka Warlock School. They requested that Cordelia put their newest student, Michael Langdon, through the Seven Wonders. Apparently, he's the Alpha, stronger than any other Supreme. But the Witches aren't having it. There's nothing to hear. There will never be a male supreme. It will simply never happen. Sorry, ladies. Michael immediately shows off how powerful he is by doing exactly what Cordelia couldn't, bringing back Queenie. Oh, and Madison as well. The supreme is shocked and passes out. 
Cordelia again envisions a horrific future and realizes that the only way to defeat Michael is with a full coven. She also notices that her own powers are weakening, so she agrees to let Michael take the Seven Wonders test. No surprises here, he passes it easily. He even brings Misty Day back to life for some extra credit. <laughs> Cordelia knows that she can't stop the apocalypse from happening, so she prepares for a post-apocalyptic battle. She puts identity spells on a handful of the newer witches and ensures that they will survive the bombings. The apocalypse goes down in 2021 and much of the Earth's population is killed. Cordelia, Myrtle, and Madison climb out of that magical New Orleans soil and make their way to Outpost 3. Here she resurrects the rest of the coven, including Mallory, who is extra special. <laughs> This allows for one final showdown with Michael Langdon. Together, the witches do their best to stop the Antichrist. But it's not until Cordelia sacrifices herself that Mallory is able to get the strength to travel back in time using Tempest Infinitum. The new Supreme makes her way to 2015 when Michael is a bratty teenager and she runs him over with her car. <laughs> Still can't believe that happened. The Antichrist is dead and the timeline is reset, meaning the apocalypse never happened. Then Mallory makes her way back to the coven for a nice little reunion. One more thing, turns out Satan had a backup plan and Antichrist 2.0 is on the way. So who knows, there's a pretty good chance that we may get yet another appearance from Cordelia Good in a final battle with Satan. Let's move on to the third and fourth character in American Horror Story portrayed by Sarah Paulson. Freak Show's conjoined twins Elizabeth and Dorothy, Bed and Dot for short, Tatler. The characters are most likely based off the famed early 1900s sideshow performers Violet and Daisy Hilton. Born in Alabama, the twins are identical in every way except their personality. Bed is seen as sweet and a little freewheeling, while Dot can come off as stern and tries to look out for Bed. Has anyone tasted your cherry pie? Oh dear God, she's a psycho pervert. She's down to earth is all. Not much is known about the twins' past. Their mother hid them away from the outside world. And during an argument, Bette would hit her breaking point and stab her mother repeatedly with a table knife. Feeling guilt for the murder, Dot stabs her sister and herself with a pair of scissors. <laughs> After the twins are brought to the hospital and stabilized, Elsa Mars pays the girls a visit before they can be questioned for homicide. She would convince them to flee the hospital with her to join her troop of freaks and become the new star attraction. But the twins soon overshadow even Elsa herself. Turns out that Dot's an extremely good singer and Elsa wasn't too happy about it. It just so happens that Dandy Mott is a big fan of the twins, so Elsa sends them off to live with him. Thankfully, the twins are rescued by Jimmy. Back at the freak show, after a few failed attempts to surgically separate the twins, Bet marries the psychotic Dandy Mott in a ploy with the rest of the freaks to take him down once and for all. I want to go home. Well, you're about to go home, right down to hell. And in 1960, it's revealed that the twins are married to Jimmy and are expecting a child with him. In the fifth season hotel, Paulson would portray Sally McKenna, AKA Hypodermic Sally. Kids are the best. Sally is a ghost who has permanently resided at the haunted Hotel Cortez ever since she was pushed out of a hotel window by Iris in 1994 for selling her son drugs. On the show, Sally can be frequently seen with the appearance that she died in, consisting of a cheetah print coat over a purple mini dress. Not much is known about Sally's past, but it's indicated that her drug addiction began soon after she was fired by musician Patti Smith in the 1980s. Patti Smith said that my poems were like glass shattering. I wrote a song with her, and then she wrote me off. <laughs> Fast forward to 1993, Sally had a threesome one night with her friends. She injected all of them with heroin, and in an insane drug-induced psychosis, she would sew all of them together. Yes, this actually happened. Her friends died of an overdose in the process, and she would be tortured by the addiction demon for three days while trapped to the corpse of her friends. Yikes. After her death, Sally resides in the hotel, taunting Iris and other guests. She even works in tandem with the addiction demon to torment the guest. Sally would soon fall in love with John Lowe, but unfortunately, it was short-lived. To help her cope, Iris gifts Sally a phone with the internet, where Sally becomes a blogger and songwriter and never has to feel alone again. 
In season six Roanoke, Paulson would play English actress Audrey Tyndall, who portrayed Shelby Miller in the documentary series My Roanoke Nightmare. And while shooting the documentary, like her co-stars, Audrey didn't buy Shelby and Matt's story, as she never had any paranormal experiences during the filming of the show. And during production, Audrey fell in love with her fellow actor Rory Monaghan, and the two were later married right before they signed up for Return to Roanoke Three Days in Hell. Bad idea. <laughs> On the very first night, Audrey sends Rory alone to go investigate the house, where he is immediately killed. F you, Sydney. Oh. Later on, after an attack by Agnes that nearly kills her, Audrey, Lee, and Monet are kidnapped by the real Polk family, who are acting in retribution for their portrayal in My Roanoke Nightmare. One thing would lead to another, and Audrey and Lee would escape the compound after they kill Mama Polk. Not long after, Lee would convince Audrey to return to the Polk compound to retrieve the Polk's camera footage. Audrey wasn't too thrilled about this mission since the tapes would have footage of Mama Polk's murder. Nevertheless, they go back to the compound and Audrey finds Monet tied up in the back room of the Polk house. She saves Monet and the two return to the Roanoke house to wait out the remaining hours of the Blood Moon without Lee. Back at the house, Audrey and Monet watch the footage of Lee's confession to Mason's murder. Monet uses this discovery to taunt Lee when she returns to the house. Bad idea, because under the influence of the witch Scathich, Lee would throw Monet off the landing onto a broken chandelier, killing her. Audrey would manage to survive the night and is found by police officers the next morning. As she's led away by the cops, Audrey catches sight of Lee. Knowing that she murdered Mason and believed that she killed Monet in cold blood, Audrey attempts to shoot her but is instead shot and killed by the police. Sarah Paulson returned for the seventh season of Cult as the lead, Allie Mayfair Richards. Allie lived in the fictional town of Brookfield Heights, Michigan, with her wife Ivy and son Ozzy. They owned a local restaurant and were politically active. We soon learn that Allie suffered a breakdown following 9-11 and lives with a handful of phobias that are triggered throughout the season. Fun fact, or maybe not so fun fact, Allie's phobias in the show were based off Paulson's real-life phobias. Some of these include cholrophobia, the fear of clowns, and trypophobia, the fear of clusters of small holes. It's the holes thing. It's repulsive. Allie suffered yet another near breakdown when Donald Trump won the 2016 presidential election. <laughs> Moving forward, her anxieties and fears escalate rapidly. Allie's therapist, Dr. Rudy Vincent, who is coincidentally Kai Anderson's older brother, tries to help her with her multiple phobias. He prescribes medication for her, but she doesn't follow her doctor's orders. She then starts to hallucinate all sorts of things, like these horrifying clowns. In yet another odd coincidence, Allie and Ivy hire a new nanny for Ozzy, and they pick Winter Anderson, Kai's younger sister. Awesome. To make matters even worse, their neighbors were murdered while Ozzy and Winter watched on. A new couple quickly moves into the house, Harrison and Meadow Wilton. We ultimately learn that nearly everyone Allie meets in the season is at one time part of Kai's growing cult. Allie continues to spiral out of control due to her fragile mental state and some horrific circumstances, like finding one of her employees, Roger, dying in the restaurant's fridge, or being attacked by a clown during a power outage, or even accidentally killing another employee, Pedro, who was coming to her aid. <laughs> Now, Allie doesn't go to jail due to Michigan's Stand Your Ground law, but local activists rally against her. Clearly, this added stress, attention, and turmoil isn't helping with her fragile mental state. Things escalate further, and Ivy decides to leave, taking Ozzy with her. But Allie soon finds out that her own wife had been a secret member of Kai's cult as well. Apparently, she despised Allie for all sorts of things, but that doesn't really justify joining a murderous cult, am I right? As Kai Anderson increases his political campaign, Allie gets thrust into the middle of an assassination attempt on his life. In actuality, the entire thing was set up. Kai had Meadow under his spell and wanted her to shoot him at a public event to help him get a political boost. She follows his orders and then kills herself. It just so happens that Allie is right there and found by the police, gun in hand, at the scene of the crime. Again, Allie isn't charged with anything, but she's put in a psychiatric ward for a few weeks. This is when, unbeknownst to the audience, she's approached by the FBI. They want Allie to infiltrate Kai's cult and help take it down. Obviously, she's down to help because she hates Kai and Ivy at this point. But more importantly, she wants to get her son back. Allie joins up with the cult and takes over as the Pentagram Clown. 
I'm not entirely sure how she managed her fear of clowns at this point of the show. Anyways, in a dramatic turn of events, Allie seemingly switches from protagonist to secret villain as she makes Ivy a home-cooked meal and poisons her. I only want two things in this life. I want Oz all to myself. And I want to watch you die. So it turns out that Allie wasn't entirely who we thought she was. She's no longer the scared, fragile victim. She's actually a very cunning and calculated killer. Allie even tricks Kai into believing that he is Ozzy's biological father, not true, and then she frames Winter. Kai kills his sister after believing that she is the mole in his cult. That's not true either. The real mole was Speedwagon, and Allie kills him. One by one, Allie is taking down the cult Kai worked so hard to build. Lost in all of this though, Allie killed a handful of people. No worries though, the FBI granted her immunity for all of her hard work helping infiltrate and bring down the cult. Kai is arrested in the subsequent FBI raid and swears to get his revenge on her. The story of Colt comes full circle as Allie takes a page out of Kai's book. She runs for state senate and sets up Kai to attempt her own assassination. Kai falls for it and Beverly shoots him dead during Allie's public debate. Already leading in the popular vote, Allie gets a political boost from the attempt on her life and wins the election. The season ends with Allie as senator and a secret member of a women's cult, a new and improved version of Scum. Paulson returned to AHS in Season 8's Apocalypse as the evil Miss Wilhelmina Venable. Welcome to Outpost 3. For a little backstory, before the bombs dropped in Season 8, Venable was a secretary for Canaros Robotics with Mutt and Jeff, where she would dole out cold-blooded burns like this. So sorry, Miss Venable, there was a bad accident on the 101. Not as bad as the accident that brought you into the world, I'm sure. On the show, we can see that Venable has a strong Victorian-style fashion sense, and walks with a cane due to her scoliosis. This causes Venable to feel ashamed of her body and despise human contact. After the apocalypse, Venable, with the help of the cooperative, becomes the administrator of Outpost 3, where she would torment the guests and enforce her own rules such as no sex, which she makes punishable by death. You're joking. Ask the two greys you saw on the way in if it's a joke. After the arrival of Antichrist Michael Langdon at Outpost 3, Venable's lust for power began to fall apart. In fact, after she learns Michael's intentions to keep her at Outpost 3 for the foreseeable future, she and Miss Mead came up with the plan to poison all the residents at Outpost 3 with poison apples and force Michael's hand. The plan backfires, and Venable then attempts to have Mead just shoot and kill Langdon. One problem, Mead isn't the real Mead. Prior to the apocalypse, Michael would enlist Jeff and Mudd at Canaros Robotics to build a lifelike android duplicate of Mead that initially believes that she's the real Miriam Mead. Unfortunately for Venable, Mead is under Langdon's control and Venable is instead shot and killed. Let us know your favorite Sarah Paulson performance in the comments below. Also, hit that subscribe button because we have a lot more AHS coming your way. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you soon.